Hello, guys. Hello, hello. Hey, Jason. How you doing? Yo. All right, guys. So, so we can uh, uh, we can start. Uh, uh, Jason, wonderful work. John, Esty, great job. I've watched uh, eight episodes yesterday, and I'm doing this interview for uh, Israel, but I am a bias for for few reasons. A, I work with uh, John Weinbach. We have done the movie On the Map and the uh, All Sea. And second of all, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, Jordan. We were all waking up at 4 a.m. in the morning to watch it live. So we remember it from then. So incredible work, all of you guys. I want to start uh, with you, Jason. How did it all uh, come to life? Well, it came to life uh, at its origin in the off season of 1997 when Andy Thompson, who was a longtime producer at NBA Entertainment, um, Clay Thompson's uncle, Michael Thompson's brother, went to Adam Silver, who was then the president of NBA Entertainment, and said uh, he had the foresight to know that they should embed cameras uh, with this team because it was going to be Michael's last year with the Bulls. So no matter what happened, win or lose, it was going to be historic. And uh, they went to Michael and Phil Jackson with that, and they assured Michael that the project would never get off the ground without his uh, approval and participation. And Adam Silver said that the worst case scenario is that you have the best home movies of all time with this. So it took <laughs> 16 years or 18 years before, uh, before it was brought to me. And, and Esty can probably pick up what happened in, in the interim there. But I only heard about this in the summer of July or the summer of 2016. Yeah. So Esty? Sure. Uh, this is, uh, again, Jason gave the beginning of the history. And then throughout the last 20 some years, there were a lot of starts and stops. There were ideas of bringing this film to life. And for a variety of reasons, some was timing, some was Michael not being ready to necessarily uh, look back and tell the story. Michael is someone who very much lives in the present. So the idea of uh, doing a documentary about his past or, or something that was more than that, he just wasn't ready. He wanted a little more time. And as we were coming up on the 20th anniversary of that season, the 97-98 season, we just felt that it might be the right time. And it, with the addition of this idea that you can do a 10-part series, uh, there's, there hadn't been a lot of that type of binge watching as we were talking about. I, how do you say binge watching in Hebrew? I, I don't know. <laughs> is, is it you know, binge watching? And the idea that you could actually bring this story to life, all those hours of behind the scenes, but also tell a bigger story and go into the characters. And so that was uh, the magic, uh, I don't want to say formula, but it felt like the right time to bring it to fans 20 years later. Right. And, and Esty, you work with Michael for how long? Uh, I, I, I know I, it sounds cliche, but I've been with him 23 years. I can't wait oh. till it's 24. So people think I'm not just making that up. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, uh, I've been with Michael 23 and a half years. Uh, my first project was actually working on Space Jam uh, in 1996. So uh, I've been with him a long time. I was six when I started. So I'm 29 now. Where do I start my story? When I was 13 and a half, games were all the way across. I only could stay two blocks, two blocks, and no blocks there. Basketball was his way out of the ghetto. I was young. I knew that he loved me, but I knew that he loved basketball, too. I saw him play. I said, <laughs> I want you to come over to play in Israel. Where? <laughs> all see Perry was. Michael Jordan and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar walled into one. He turns himself and his team into the kings of Europe. The moment he looked at her, that was it. <laughs> yeah, I think it was love at first sight. She was the big European model, one of the top ten, and he was the basketball superstar. It was a phenomenon in the late 70s. Kemi wasn't sure she would marry him. They were the first mixed couple. She was Jewish, and he wasn't. With all the joy and excitement, inside it was a dead feeling. I started to take a, a lot of pain pills. He was in Tommy's apartment. He wasn't really moving. She was scared he was dead. He was different. Cool. Different. Uh-oh. 
always knew one thing. That I wanted to tell you my story the way it is. And John, you've done a lot of uh, wonderful projects. The other Dream Team, which now bring you full circles to the Dream Team, and the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar movie, and of course the Feminimus on the Muppet Hosey, <laughs> which has nothing to do with. But uh, tell me, uh, how did this project came to uh, MSM, and, uh, and how did uh, you guys convince uh, uh, Jason and Esty uh, and Michael, obviously? initially to do this well i mean it, it's one of those things the, the footage as you know jason and as you mentioned this has been sort of like a holy grail for a long time you know uh i had heard about it in the early 2000s uh because a friend of mine who had worked at emmy entertainment and so there was always this knowledge it was about but it came sort of the discussions in earnest i think were in toronto 2016 the coldest i've ever been as a human being at the all-star weekend and I went with my you know, awesome partner, Mike Tolan, who's you know, chairman of Manly Sports Media. And it was this notion of, hey, you know, maybe this is the, conference the time to have the conversation um, and there might be an opening. And it really was a series of conversations uh, between Mike and Esty and Curtis Polk. Um, and then led to this you know, fateful meeting between that, that Esty and Curtis had set up with Michael in June of uh, 2016. And, and we prepared a quite exhaustive lookbook uh, presentation. And, you know, it's funny, you talk about the series, we, we went back and forth, could six, could it be eight, could it be 10, could it be somewhere in between and, and put together the book. And, you know, I don't know what the magic sauce was um, that day that, that convinced uh, Michael, but I think, you know, I'd like to think our track record, Mike's track record, you know, in doing a lot of sports programming over the years helped, you know, helped our cause. Um, but that's sort of how it came through. I mean, it would not have been possible, obviously, without SD, without Curtis, and without Michael. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know, you know, SD would know best of all of us what was the alchemy that allowed Michael to say yes. But I, I do think, you know, Mike put it in the letter that we put together in the book, which is, we talk about it all the time. It's 20 years. That, and, and, and I know this because I, you know, have interns and, and junior people at our company who they have never seen Michael Jordan play. He exists only as a brand or on YouTube. And, and how terrible, you know, that, that shouldn't be the case. And might this be the time? And so, you know, we were able to, to put together this presentation and, and Michael said yes. And then, you know, in terms of with Jason, we had tried to hire Jason seven years ago for a project we did um, with the NBA. And so um, I certainly knew his work and had huge amounts of respect for it. And, and, you know, he was a natural for this. So that's in terms of, you know, uh, the, the Jason of it all. And, and then, you know, it, it continued on for another two years before we actually started production in earnest. And, and Jason, for somebody who has done uh, sports movies for a long time, I want to tell you that what you have done is incredible. And uh, I just watched, you know, the... Uh, first eight episodes, and it is Michael Jordan's level. That's what I can tell you. But I would love for you to tell us um, about the first meeting with Michael Jordan, because if John Weinbach would have called me and tell me that uh, uh, I, I should talk to Michael, it's almost like he will tell me, and really, even, we, even though we are from Israel and we're Jewish, he is really for us like God. <laughs> and uh, we're not just saying that. So tell me about the day that you're about to meet with God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people from a lot of countries would, would, would offer that same sentiment. But um, Esty was smart enough to know that Michael's comfort level um, was vital in this process. Um, I try to spend time with anyone I'm going to interview on any project, big or small, before we sit them down in a chair, because there's just not a natural way to have a, a free flowing conversation with somebody with lights and cameras and boom mics around. And, and certainly Michael is more comfortable with that than anyone alive because he's done it a million times, but you still need to have at least um, a sense of safety and comfort with the person sitting across from you if you're going to start revealing things and a sense of trust and that the person is responsible. 
So Esty thought it was imperative uh, to get me in front of Michael a few times before we actually sat down, just to get him familiar with me. And, and Esty could probably tell you why she, she, she felt that way, but I'm glad she did. And I will never forget the day, it was, it was a Wednesday. I was in my apartment and I was in my gym clothes to go to a boxing gym around the corner here in New York. And um, she texted me and said, hey, can you get up to Midtown by 7 p.m.? And it was 6.30. And the, the short answer is no, that's physically impossible for me to get up there where I am way downtown. But um, when, when Michael Jordan wants to have a drink, then you, you figure out a way to, to time travel. So got up there as soon as I could. And um, I remember Essie said, at long last, Jason meet Michael, Michael meet Jason. And this, this huge hand came out like this. And, you know, he's got this charisma that there's certain people that you hear about Elvis and, and um, you know, these icons that people will say, you know, you feel like the only person in the world when you're talking to him, Michael has that. And I expected, I'm a cynic because I've been around superstars a lot and in a lot of, you know, I've just been in sports television and, and, and kind of celebrity adjacent world being in production. And I know that kind of the bigger the star, the more insulated they are and oftentimes the more aloof they are. Michael was the opposite of that. So immediately uh he was with his wife Yvette was there and we were talking I think there was just a hurricane in Florida we were talking about things that you would talk about if you were just meeting another couple uh, and having a drink in a lounge at a hotel not that it's Michael Jordan it was just this this guy Michael sitting across and soon we started talking about the project he was there for NBA meetings and we were talking about various things going on in the NBA and then we started talking about the project I said to him why do you want to do this and he said I don't she does and he pointed at <laughs> I said, why not and he proceeded to, to tell me that a lot of the footage was raw and, and, and he was reluctant to, to show it. He said, there was a guy named Scotty Burrell and I rode him up and down the floor every day at practice. He was my pet project, but I needed to get him tough if we were gonna compete against the Indianas and the New Yorks and the Miamis of the league. I needed him to be tough. I needed to know that I could count on him off the bench. So we went into this explanation, which was a very good explanation. And I said, the, the great thing is that we have 10 hours to tell the story. So you'll be able to offer context and we can interview Scotty for his perspective. And it won't be just a clip that's shown out of context and people think, oh God, that he's demanding and, and a tough teammate, tough to be around. He demands a lot out of himself. Uh, he demands more out of himself than he does out of those around him. And I think that Michael uh, leads by example in, in a lot of ways because he's the first one in and the last one out um, in a lot of the footage. So those guys, they followed him and, and they followed him to the tune of, of six rings. But I think he wanted that entire uh, perspective to be shown, and he was reluctant um, to have it be shown without context. So it was just a really wise move on Estes' part and a generous move because it's not the easiest thing to do to, to get someone in front of Michael to spend even a little bit of time with him. But it was, it was well worth it because by the time he walked in uh, almost a year later um, to that first interview with cameras, uh, we, we had a level of comfort enough that we could sit down and have a conversation and, and he knew that he was in a safe place. You know, knowing the European, you know, uh, basketball, he was, he was the star. We are, by the way, the fans of Maccabi Tel Aviv are still angry about Tony Kukuc who's filming some of the Europeans Cup from us. And of course, uh, Phil Jackson. And I'm sure, uh, John, you can also weigh into digging and fishing more material. Because working with John Weibach, I can see him sitting with Jason and say, wait, 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 one minute. I got it. I got it. I found it. You know, he knows how to find things from out of nowhere. So tell me a little bit about the scope of that work, because that's a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, the I mean, there's a lot here. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, there's many elements of the project that are, I love and that, Jason has done such a masterful job of corralling. Um, and one of the things, is, and we talked about this early on, was like, hey, would we have enough material? Was there enough for 10 episodes? You know, if we're just going to do the 97, 98 season, how much are we going to go into depth on X, Y, or Z? And there were multiple outlines that went through. And I said it, you know, from the first cuts, and, and I remember having a conversation with Jason. It was like, hey, maybe we, I think you even said, like, the, the, the characters are so strong and they've become only more um, significant and interesting with time than some of those other asides we don't even need, you know, and, and you're able to live in the stories of, of, and you'll see in episode nine and Kerr, and, you know, in, in think about these characters, Scotty Pippen, Phil Jackson, Rodman, um, you know, Kukoc was an icon on his own, and the, the whole story of how he became, and it illuminates the Jerry Krause relationship. 
And so, you know, it's such a masterful job of, it's easy to say on a piece of paper, oh, we're going to use the story of the 97, 98 season as a through line to tell these other stories and take departures. But in point of fact, actually executing that is really hard and and also making sure the stories cohere and have ups and downs and the interviews that jason did are i mean you know this i was a reporter and so the, i i always look at it that way and his interviews are so fantastic and he allows them the, the space to, to have their say and then you know you asked about archival you know how big a geek i am about archival i i think you know the team that jason assembled is the best that i've worked with and, you know it's jake rogal it's a guy named matt maxson and a woman named nina christich who was the archival producer for the OJ project. She's unbelievable. They're all unbelievable, but like there's so many of these great archival finds and that we, we had the luxury of time, of, of time in terms of editorial time um, in, in 10 episodes to tell those stories, but it's a team effort. But, but I just, I always come back to the interviews that, that Jason did. I was lucky enough to go to the Steve Kerr interview um, and uh, it was, you know, I was in tears and you'll see, you know, in, in episode nine and, and it's, that combination of humanity, incredibly thorough homework, and you know, really being able to get people comfortable and get them to tell their story so it doesn't feel um, artificial. Yeah, and you know, when we've done on the map, uh, you know, we always said that the greatest sports stories are the ones that are not just sport, they are much larger than that. And for us, you know, the 1977 team that beat the Russians during the Cold War, became national heroes when the captain says we're on the map. It really felt like they put the country on the map by beating the Russians uh, during the Cold War. And they became like the Beatles in Israel. And I felt in many times that these guys were like the Beatles. So it wasn't like a Beatlemania. It was an MJ mania, you know, let's call it. And, and you were able to show it uh, with the archive. Uh, Jason, were you thinking while you were doing it that you're showing a piece of history for the younger generation? Did you realize that what you're capturing here is something that will be taught in schools? Uh, yeah, I, I did feel the weight of responsibility to tell this story the right way and, and to have um, a younger generation appreciate Michael and those bulls the way that I did, uh, the way that I still do. Um, but that's a privilege. You know, I, when you say weight of responsibility, I don't want you to picture me stressed and tearing my hair out. I did that too, but it, it wasn't because that's why of he's that. wearing a hat, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's, there, there's less. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's, I just feel incredibly lucky. This, this, there, there's so many things, there's so many parts of this process and so many directors who would have done a great job with this and and to, for the timing for the universe to have aligned the way that it aligned um for just for for, for michael and for sd and curtis and, and allison Tadowski to all decide this is the time right at the time where i'm free to be in new york when when michael was there with sd and to meet with him and there's so many things that could have gone the wrong way and um you know i'm, I'm just thankful for that and i feel incredibly privileged and proud my team feels proud uh, to tell this story because it, it's the most significant sports story of my lifetime. And I think that we had this epiphany early on in, in the research. I said to our lead editor, Chad Beck, I came in one day, like I had just discovered something. I said, this is an underdog story. I'm trying to th think of what this, what is the movie about? This is about underdogs. It's about overachievers. And, and, and from 35,000 feet, you don't see the bulls as underdogs. You see that uh, as dominant, um, that they, that they just dominated whoever was in their path in, in the nineties. But if you take it at ground level individually, Michael was cut, we know, his sophomore year. He was going to give up basketball if not for Dolores Jordan, his mom convincing him to practice and, and get himself better. She didn't call the coach and say, you know, and complain. She didn't tell Michael, yeah, quit. Who needs these people? She said work harder. And it's such a lesson of per per perseverance in that. The same for Scottie Pippen, who barely, he barely had shoes that he learned to play basketball in because he played on a dust, dirt court. The same as Steve Kerr, who wasn't even recruited to go to D1 colleges coming out of high school and ends up making a shot to win the title for them in 97. All of these at ground level are underdog stories. So to, to, to have that epiphany, to find it out, and then to bring that to people and give them the lesson, especially younger kids, that yeah, Michael flies through the air and it's a cool logo and a cool brand to wear, 
but there's something behind that. There's a spirit behind that and an inspiration behind that. That's so much more than, than just fashion and lifestyle. It, it's, it's, it's a culture and it's a way of thinking. It's a way of approaching life. So I'm incredibly proud. And I hope that people get even a smidgen of what I just uh, described when they watch. <laughs> Basketball was the number one topic in Israel. When I got there, I was really surprised because inside me, I realized that we had a chance to do something. Maccabi Tel Aviv playing for the European Cup Championship? Are you kidding me? Who are these guys? It wasn't that long after the war. The country was starving for something that lifted the country. Moshe Dayan was the most recognizable face in the world except for Muhammad Ali. He was at every one of our games and shaking our hands, and uh, afterwards the battle begins. Moshe Dayan coming to shake the other team's hand is intimidation. For the Russian team, they knew that they had the best team in Europe that beat the American team in the Olympics. Red Army Moscow had all of the great players from the national team. Maccabi carried the hopes of a nation. My first thought was, damn. There was no reason to expect Maccabi could beat Red Army Moscow. The streets were empty. You couldn't get a taxi. Nothing moved. The excitement was just too much. I wanted more. There are some things that are more important than sport. It is easily one of the greatest sporting accomplishments ever. All that excitement, all that pride, it just came out of my heart. And Esti, who impacted you more, the Jewish camp or Michael Jordan? <laughs> Um, you know, anyone who knows me, listen, I'm, I'm a, I'm a child of immigrants, you know, so I, I give so much to my mom who was Israeli, who came to this country, my father, who was a Holocaust survivor and the same work ethic that, uh, Michael had in terms of working hard. I, I'm not as competitive as Michael, but I definitely work as hard as he does. So, um, I think through the years of uh, my leadership and my identity was definitely formed, by BBYO, which was a Jewish youth organization. I, I grew up in a small town where there was a lot of anti-Semitism and I was teased. And that youth group gave me, um, you know, a, some, my, some of my identity and pride. And I was able to persevere and get to a higher level and work. And um, so I owe a lot, I, I, as much as I love Michael and I've learned so much from him, um, who I am and, and what I am is, is a lot from my upbringing, from my family and uh, the Jewish youth group I was involved with. And Joan, I know you have a soft spot uh, for Israel and for our country, not only because I know you and work with you and uh, admire your talent. Uh, what do you want to say to the Israeli fans that are, you know, really biting their, their nails just waiting for the next episodes? <laughs> Well, A, Shalom, and I miss them. I have my, my dad's two sisters made Aliyah, and I have a lot of first cousins um, uh, in Israel. Um, you know, it's, I have a very particular, specific Israel connection to Michael Jordan. I was in Israel in 1995 when, when the Bulls lost to the Magic. And I remember I was watching in the playoffs at, I think, Mike's place in Migrash Arusi in Jerusalem at like three in the morning. And it felt like the world was like tilting on its axis. It's like, Michael Jordan's been eliminated from the playoffs and he's like wearing 45 and like, like the world's melting. And I just remember walking, you know, in Jerusalem when that happened. And I thought about that when we were, uh, I, I can't recall which episode it's in now. I think it's episode, I can't remember. Yes, eight. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, when we recount that and, and, you know, just all the years, I mean, 
look, Jason grew up in Boston. He's a Celtics fan. I, you, as you know, a Laker dial. Um, and Jordan was bigger than that. As, as, as hard as it is for me to say that as a die hard, die hard Laker fan, it was, you know, he, 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 he uh, you know, crossed over the generation from analog to digital, right? You know, worldwide media. So, um, you know, I, I just think about in a previous generation, when would we have been watching the NBA in Israel at three in the morning? Michael Jordan, that, that was that era. Uh, I just want everybody to enjoy it. And I'm, you know, I'm in awe of the work that, that the team did, that, that Jace did, very grateful to be a part of it. And I uh, just want to be, you know, people to watch it. Yeah. Esti, oh, for you, I, something for your for your relatives in the uh, oh yeah, I have that are, so they can't wait to watch more of this episode. Yeah, I'm I'm so excited that uh, Israel has embraced this story. I understand from Netflix that it's uh, top three uh, in Israel, so I love that the fans are watching it, and I I hope they see a story of inspiration as Jason explained and. Uh, you know, I, I was supposed to be in Israel in June, uh, and unfortunately, I think my trip is going to be canceled, but uh, John and I had joked about maybe doing a premiere uh, in Tel Aviv because, or in Jerusalem, because that's when we were originally supposed to launch it, uh, which would have been fun, so I'm sorry I can't be there, but uh, I, I got to tell you one funny story because I was thinking about it today. Uh, years ago, Michael had donated money to the University of North Carolina for a school of social work. And at the opening ceremonies of the School of Social Work, they had invited Leah Ravine uh, to come be the main speaker. And uh, Yitzhak Ravine, who was obviously uh, uh, someone that I admire in terms of his, uh, you know, his, his approach to peace in Israel at the time, and he had been assassinated the year prior. And she came to talk because she was talking about um, children who grow up in inner cities who deal with conflict were very similar with the children in Israel with some of the conflict. And so she was the main speaker. And I was there with Michael and his family and we were in an area. And after she spoke, uh, they said they came to our room and said, Leah Rabin would like to meet Michael. And we said, sure. And, you know, she came in, she had a lot of like, you know, police protection, Mossad agents, whatever, all around her, a lot of security. And so she comes in and she's speaking in Hebrew to her staff and she's talking about Michael. So of course I'm standing next to Michael. Michael's like, this is so awkward. What is she, you know, what is she saying? And I'm like, she's saying you're really tall. And so, so, so I'm sitting there interpreting and suddenly they look over at me and said like, you know, how do, how do you speak Hebrew? And, and, uh, and she was so excited to hear that a, a daughter of a woman from B'nai Brock worked for Michael Jordan. And, uh, and then it became her mission to try and get me to get Michael over to Israel, uh, which I have not been successful at yet. Uh, his mother and sister have been there and have loved it, but uh, hopefully one day we'll bring him there. But I always loved that story. And my mom was so excited that I got to meet uh, Leia Rabin. I think that was more important to my mom than, um, than who I worked for. <laughs> so. and we, before we finish, Jason, the one thing that you will take from uh, making this project, what is the one thing that you're taking from Michael or from this whole process? Nothing is easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what, that, that, there's a bad connotation to that, um, but people like Michael who make things look easy, who accomplish such significant achievements, it looks like it comes naturally to them. You know, Michael is described as gifted and, you know, it's a lot more than that. Michael probably wasn't the best athlete on that team. He may have been the third best athlete on that team. This is hard work, this is drive, this is perseverance, dedication, and, and a refusal to, to uh, tolerate mediocrity, to, to, to down to the minute details. I mean, when he signed on to this thing, I know that how I felt about it, and I bet SD uh, can, can attest that Michael felt the same way. I'm, as com I'm not as competitive as him, my God, but I'm certainly competitive in my field. And, and, and when we got greenlit, the goal was, let's be the best sports documentary of all time nothing less. And it was a tough road to hold because we have a lot of partners who gave a lot of input and everyone felt really adamant about things. But every single time we went through one of those valleys, this creative valley, and we had to fight it out, it came out better. And, and whether it was SD's opinion or Curtis's opinion or ESPN wanted something or Netflix, the best idea won out. And it was because it just reflected in, in the way that Michael lives. You do it the best all the time or you don't do it. And that's how I feel with my team too. They, they can attest to that as well. So we had a lot of people 
who have the same mindset that there's nothing less than the best will accept from ourselves or from others in our team. And, and now we have a, a product that hopefully people are going to enjoy for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's well said. And, and I got to give kudos to Jason because we drove him crazy. <laughs> um, you know, and, and again, when you talk about a lot of voices on this project, um, between the NBA, our team, Netflix, ESPN, and Mandalay, and Jason had a lot of people and he was able to uh, take the feedback, sift through it. And every time, I mean, this week would be a perfect example. Episode 10, like, we really, really want it to be amazing. And down to like <laughs> the littlest detail. I mean, we really were working really hard on it. And Jason has been incredible. And last night when we got the final uh, prod, uh, final uh, edit, we were so excited because Jason and his team just really, really created a great project that we're all proud of. So This is a good example, though, is that it would have been really easy to let up this week because it was such an incredible response to last Sunday. And, and the thing is that Monday morning, we're all waking up and, and I walk eight feet to my desk and get right back on the edit because we still have eight, nine, and 10. It would have been really easy to say, you know what? People love it. We're exhausted. Let's just get to the finish line. Here's a rough cut of 10. It's good enough. Let's just go. Good enough is not good enough. And every single person on this team feels exactly that way. So it was, let's keep grinding it out. We have eight more steps to get this rock up this hill. And Sisyphus is gonna win at the end of this one. We will win. So we got one more week, nose to the grindstone, let's do it. And every single person top to bottom on the team said, let's do it. And I'm tremendously proud of, of 10. So this week, as Esty said, is a really good microcosm for, for how this operation um, achieved what it achieved. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for your time and Mostly, thank you so much for the gift you brought to the world. Uh, we are honored. I'm honored to, to know you guys. Jason, uh, you're an inspiration. Even the way you speak, even the way you were uh, talking right now and saying, okay, you know, I could have let go, but I didn't want it. I want to push it, you know, um, you know and I want to run through the tape mm -hmm. uh, until the end. Uh, because that was Michael, because Michael could have had five, you know, championship, and he was the greatest anyway, anyhow, and he ran through the tape, and you guys have done it uh, as well, so uh, I'm very, very happy that uh, you're here, and you're with us, and you're part of, uh, and you were part of this uh, incredible journey, and for giving us the gift of, uh, of this movie and this piece of history. So from, on the map, from Israel, <laughs> Thank you so much. And I can't wait to see episode nine and 10 because up to one to eight, <laughs> I could not finish watching. You know, I could not go to bed. So, Toda Raba, we say. Toda. Jason, Toda do you know Toda Raba? I don't. <laughs> you just say Bavaka Shah right back. Bavaka Shah? There Boom. you go. There Bavaka. you go. Boom. You got it. <laughs>